Okay. So good morning, and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference for the uh, chance here to speak to you today about the dynamics of 2D turbulence in magnetically confined tokamak plasmas. So uh, I've noticed that there isn't too much coverage of uh, magnetically confined plasmas at this conference, so I'm going to take a little step back and review some of the basics of it, kind of put the problem in context, why it is we care about turbulence in fusion plasmas. Um, just a brief introduction, again, I'm George McKee. I work with the University of Wisconsin, but I work at the D3D National Fusion Facility, which is located at General Atomics in San Diego, California. So why do we care about turbulence? Well, it turns out that it's a critical issue for the development of fusion energy, which has been a goal for uh, many scientists for a long time. Uh, it turns out that it's a very fundamental and basic topic to plasma science, fusion energy sciences, and ultimately the, the development of fusion energy. So it's, um, the reason we care about it is because turbulence drives uh, radial cross-field transport of particles, energy, and momentum across the magnetically confining surfaces. And ultimately, it helps set a fundamental parameter, which is called the global energy confinement time. This is basically how well the plasma keeps the heat and particles inside of it. And as a result of turbulence, there is a significant well, reduction in the energy confinement time relative to what would happen from, you would get from basic neoclassical pro uh, processes. And ultimately, this determines the size and cost of fusion reactors. And I show you here a picture of the Eder Tokamak, which is under construction in Cadarache, France. It's a very large international project. Uh, it's designed to demonstrate the feasibility of fusion energy, but its size is, is quite large. There's a canonical person down here. You probably can't even see him because he's too small. The scales of this are tens of meters, uh, and that's basically driven by the fundamentals of the energy confinement, which come down to the turbulence that's inside the plasma. But more fundamentally, and perhaps of more interest to this community, is that the turbulence is a, is a highly complex uh, system. It exhibits strongly nonlinear dynamics across multiple spatial and temporal scales. And the plasma turbulence is largely two-dimensional. Not entirely. There are important 3D effects. But it can be described largely as two-dimensional in nature, and therefore has some strong connections to fluid dynamics, planetary, atmospheric, uh, geophysics, and astrophysics. So just to be a little more particular in this, some of the commonalities between plasma turbulence and, uh, say, planetary or fluid turbulence, such as uh, atmospheres, you have a very similar phenomenon of having rotation sources, whether it's Coriolis or the Lorentz force in a magnetized plasma. Uh, you have energy sources sort of in the middle of the plasma or at the equator. Common physical equations, uh, hasagawa mima in plasmas versus the Charnio-Kukov in uh, Planetary plasmas, Rossby waves, are very analogous to drift waves in plasma. Then, of course, you have large-scale flows, zonal flows, we call them in plasmas, or uh, jet streams, as you might see in planetary atmospheres. And I'll be talking about measurements of some of these parameters later. So how do we end up with large turbulence in a magnetically confined plasma? Well, in order to achieve the conditions required for fusion energy, you have to have a very hot core. Uh, typically, the center, you want it to be in, on the order of 15 kiloelectron volts in order to sustain the nuclear fusion reactions. Uh, correspondingly, there's a relatively high density. And so you end up with a system that at the core has a pressure close to one atmosphere. It turns out it's uh, coincidentally about a million times hotter than the atmosphere, but also about a million times less dense but around 1 to 10 atmospheres in a reactor at the core. But this drops off to near zero at the edge, and uh, where you essentially have the vacuum condition. This leads to very large pressure gradients that vary, and when combined with the magnetic geometry, uh, lead to uh, strong, very strong gradients in both it's separately the density, ion temperature, electron temperature, and flow velocity, which can also be a stabilizing factor. This, in turn, drives turbulence in uh, multiple fields, density, temperature, electrostatic potential, and magnetic fields, which then drives cross-field transport of the various kinetic uh, um, properties, density, temperature, et cetera, which then feeds back on and limits the gradients that uh, are allowed to be sustained in the plasma. There's sort of a fundamental nature to this turbulence. It has both an electrostatic and electromagnetic component. And they both add up and give, result in a particle flux and a heat flux. And there's some exotic names for some of the specific instabilities that arise, ion temperature, electron temperature gradient modes, 
trapped electron modes, et cetera, that arise because of the specific geometry, the kinetic po particle populations, et cetera. Um, the, the basic nature of this is that you, it's similar to uh, turbulence in any system, that you have some sort of driving force or driving scale. In this case, there's energy that goes in at around the ion gyro radius. And for a typical pla magnetically confined plasma, this can be on the order of several millimeters. And then that energy gets dissipated through your kind of standard uh, forward cascade to uh, high K uh, dissipated regimes. But because it's, lar it's largely two-dimensional in nature, you also have an inverse cascade to uh, uh, low, uh, low wave number and ultimately leading to the development of stabilizing or saturating zonal flow phenomena. And we'll talk more about that later. And this has been observed experimentally. Uh, here's a wave number spectrum uh, from the Tor Supra experiment in um, Cataract, France. Um, and they've seen uh, the wave number does seem to have a break point at sort of near the ion gyro radius. So this makes some sense. And I'll be showing you some more experimental data later that sort of uh, supports that viewpoint. So where are we making these measurements? Um, I realize me, people may not be so familiar with the, uh, the facility here. So this is the D3D National Fusion Facility. It's a tokamak facility uh, operated again at General Atomics in San Diego, and it's designed to ultimately uh, do the science behind developing fusion energy systems. And it has several major elements to the research program. It pursues sort of fundamental fusion science, which includes a study of turbulence, alphanic modes, energetic particle modes, magnetohydrodynamics, et cetera. It also addresses some specific issues towards the technology of developing fusion energy, and also optimizing the plasma confinement. So for a given magnetic field, which tends to be expensive, how much pressure can you contain in there by optimizing the, um, the current density, the kinetic profiles, et cetera. One thing I wanted to highlight to this community is that we have started, uh, just this past year, a so-called frontier science campaign. And this is basically a campaign that opens up the facility to basic uh, plasma science that may not be, or in fact, in principle, is not connected to the fusion application, but perhaps can be done in the toroidal ge geometry uh, for, with the parameters and the heating systems and the diagnostic systems that we have available. So we actually reached out to a community from universities and um, national labs that work in related fields, but not necessarily directly in fusion energy, to pursue some fundamental topics in, um, again, turbulence and uh, alphanic instabilities, uh, flux ropes, there's uh, reconnection physics, et cetera. And this will be continuing next year. So if people have ideas and are interested in doing this work, it's sort of a new experimental uh, campaign, but we're, uh, it seems to be successful after its first year. So I'm not going to go through this in detail. I just want to, in a sense, convey how seriously we take uh, turbulence in uh, magnetically confined plasmas. We've developed a very wide range of diagnostics, microwave-based, optically-based systems that measure a, a range of fields, density, temperature, electron temperature, ion temperature, magnetic fields, and uh, electrostatic potential over a range of different scales that are relevant to turbulent transport. So you could spend uh, hours just going through the various systems. I'm not going to do that here, but just want to let you know that these do exist and they are, we work in concert to obtain these measurements in a wide range of experiments to understand the role and impact of turbulence on the magnetically confined plasmas. Again, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but the data I'm going to be showing you for the rest of this talk was primarily obtained with a, a density fluctuation diagnostic uh, called beam emission spectroscopy. It's an optical diagnostic system that observes emissions from a heating neutral beam that are excited but not ionized uh, by plasma collisions. They emit a photon that's observed spectroscopically, and then with high-speed optics um, detectors, we measure the localized density characteristics uh, because the emission intensity can be related directly to the local density fluctuations in the plasma. So for what I'll be showing today, we've deployed a 2D grid, because again, the turbulence primarily is two-dimensional in nature, and that's primarily in the, the so-called radial direction, that's horizontal in this orientation, and the poloidal or azimuthal direction, which is sort of vertical in this direction here. The characteristic scales of the turbulence are, again, a couple centimeters, so we have about one centimeter resolution in this radial poloidal plane. So you can think of it, it's about the size of your hand, the detection zone that we're looking at. And we locate it near the outside edge of the plasma here because that's where there is a particularly strong uh, turbulence effects. It's where uh, particles and energy get transported out of the plasma into the um, surrounding zone. 
So what does the turbulence look like? I don't typically show raw data, but I thought since you're a turbulence community, you could probably uh, appreciate that. So here's some actual raw traces. This is a 300 microsecond time window from three uh, poloidally adjacent channels showing the turbulence here and how it evolves. So primarily, it looks like noise. It is the turbulence. And you can actually see that there's pretty high coherence among these three different spatially separated channels. In fact, if you measure the coherence, it can be uh, up to 0.8 or so between these channels. And it's being uniformly convected across the plasma or uh, azimuthally by background uh, E-cross B uh, forces. So that leads to a finite convection and a so-called phase shift between these uh, poloidally adjacent channels. So these measurements are uh, fairly uh, high quality. They allow us to look at the dynamics in uh, 1D and two dimensions uh, near the edge of this plasma. So here's a couple of uh, images. There are a set of images that were obtained in a uh, uh, so-called L-mode plasma on D3D. Each of these frames is separated by four microseconds. Uh, we use kind of an interpolation method to colorize the pictures and show the advancement, but keep in mind that this, the original data is obtained on an eight by eight grid. And if you follow some of the individual structures, I'll show you a movie in a moment, but you can kind of see them advecting from frame to frame. And it's very asymmetric radially and vertically, so I want to point that out and just orient you ahead of time. So the horizontal direction is a radial direction, uh, sort of going out from the hot core to the cold edge, and the vertical direction is the azimuthal direction. That's sort of in the, uh, along a confining magnetic flux surface. There's a background advection in the plasma, again coming from an E cross B flow uh, that you'll be able to see in the visualization. So here I'm going to just show you the, um, let's see how this works, okay. Uh, this is an actual movie and it's adva advancing at the rate of um, 10 microseconds per second of real time. So it's got an inflation factor of 10 to the fifth here. And you can see the individual eddy structures, uh, the sort of adve advecting upwards, that's sort of the dominant uh, kinetic that your eye will catch. But you can see that there's a lot of complex interactions going on within the plasma. You see eddies sometimes merging together and sometimes kind of tearing apart. There is, a, there is a shear flow in the background here which interacts strongly with the eddy structures. And again, the, you can see visually that the structures have a few centimeter correlation length. This is directly traceable back to the ion uh, gyro radius in the magnetic field as sort of the fundamental length scale, which is again is a few, cent, uh, few millimeters typically in these conditions. Um, but there's a very strong asymmetry between the radial and the poloidal dynamics, and also with the correlation lengths, as it turns out. Um, so you can watch these for a long time. But the question is, what can we determine from the dynamics of the turbulence? So we're going to apply some analysis techniques that actually were developed in fluid mechanics to try to infer some or quantify some of the detailed dynamics of the turbulent eddy structures and ultimately how they're resulting in the cross-field transport um, of particles and density. So here, this quantifies the images, the spectra in a little more detail. Um, again, you like, like looking at spectra. So these are time, res or time average spectra at several locations. The, uh, the parameter, the spatial parameter here is the so-called normalized minor radius where one is the boundary of the plasma, zero would be the core of the plasma. So you can see there's a very strong variation in both the amplitude as well as the spectral shape across the plasma. You get a, co a combination of both local amplitude and Doppler shifted, uh, E cross B Doppler shift effects that um, change the frequency. The fluctuation amplitude is, uh, has a large dynamic range. At the rear, very edge of the plasma, it can be up to near 10%. That's the N tilde over N, the equilibrium density. So you get this sort of turbulence, virtual dirt turbulence storm near the boundary of the plasma. Then it can drop down below 1% within just a, a few centimeters spatially or uh, about 20% of the minor radius. And this very strong edge turbulence might in fact be a source of the uh, spreading that might impact core confinement in a stronger way than we might think. You heard about this, uh, Pak Su Han presented this talk on um, Monday or Tuesday on this topic. And we think that perhaps this very large edge turbulence is a source of um, that avalanche spreading of, um, of turbulence into the core. Some of the other spatial characteristics are shown here. Um, this is a radial correlation function where I've taken a reference channel in the middle of the array, and you can see that there's a, a radially asymmetric uh, function here. And this can be traced back to the, the ion gyro rate, oh, sorry, ion gyro radius being uh, shorter on one side rather than the other side because there is a strong temperature gradient at this region of the plasma. 
Um, poloidally, you have this wave-like structure. This shows that there's a very strong asymmetry in the radial and poloidal structure of the turbulence. And here this shows a full 2D map of that. So you have this sort of wave-like structure in uh, the azimuthal or poloidal direction and a sort of monotonically decaying radial structure. Uh, again, showing you the strong. Um, and we can invert these and look at the S of K structures and do that routinely. I'm not going to show that right here. But uh, one of the things I claimed earlier was that the ion gyro radius was sort of a fundamental scaling parameter. And I just want to show you some data that backs that up. So we did experiments where we varied the ion gyro radius by varying the confining magnetic field and other dimensionless variables were held constant. And when we did that, we, we saw that the, um, the, the measured correlation length of the turbulence scaled just with the ion gyro radius. So if you look at the normalized ratio of the plasma turbulence correlation length to the gyro radius, you see a fairly uh, flat um, a uniform dependence, about a factor of five there. But again, it does change uh, quite a bit uh, numerically. Likewise, the temporal decorrelation time can be measured. It tends to be on the order of about 5 to 10 or 20 microseconds, but it scales with this so-called gyrokinetic time scale, which comes from the underlying theory of uh, how turbulence is driven in these plasmas. And you can see that the, even when you vary the parameters quite a bit, when you normalize it to this parameter, you get fairly uniform uh, normalization of the temporal decorrelation time. And this can be thought of as sort of a turnover time or eddy lifetime which is important, very important for uh, how rapidly it convex energy and, and particles. Here's also some measurements with a much different diagnostic technique on a different machine, but they, uh, this lineup, uh, when it's normalized properly, gives you some uh, support for the uh, idea that, the, that this is a good normalizing factor and you're getting similarly or self-similar turbulence on much different uh, machines with different measurement techniques. So looking a little more critically at, uh, and, and quantitatively at the dynamics, we've applied some velocimetry techniques to the data. Uh, these techniques have been uh, developed in fluid mechanics, and they, uh, uh, we particularly, oops, sorry. Sorry about that. We uh, use a particular technique called orthogonal dynamic programming. It results in a velocity field, uh, basically a radial poloidal field that's a function of space and time. And um, it shows us a lot of the dynamics of these turbulent eddy structures. Again, we applied this uh, uh, to the data. It gives us a, a V of uh, R, Z, and T. And from these measurements, then, we can infer quantities such as zonal flow behavior, the Reynolds stress, particle flux, vorticity, enstrophy, et cetera, and uh, interpret, again, some of the dynamics of the, uh, the turbulence here. So I'm not going to go through this in detail. This is just the technique as it was developed in fluid mechanics, uh, particularly to look at uh, particle imaging velocimetry. It turns out to apply fairly well to the, the much lower spatial resolution, but sort of the blobby or smoke-like structure of the turbulent eddy structures. So this is similar background images to, which I, to what I showed you earlier, but now I'm superimposing uh, on top of that the velocity field, a 2D vector, again, in R and Z. And when I show you the movie of this, you can see that there's some uh, very unique dynamics, again, some differences in the radial and poloidal structure that are very important to the um, particle transport that results from this. So this is actually a different plasma from the one I showed you earlier. So actually, the background turbulent eddies are uh, behaving in a somewhat different fashion. One thing you'll note is that there's sort of a natural shear flow that develops in this plasma. You can see a very strong sort of vertically upwards advection uh, at this one radius. And then just a few centimeters over, you actually see a downward advection of the turbulent eddy. So there's a very strong shear layer that's developing uh, right across this area here. And this turns out to be very important for a phenomenon that's known as the uh, low confinement to high confinement transition. In fact, this plasma is about to undergo such a transition. And you'll see the turbulence get very large. The eddy structures are getting uh, increasing in amplitude and getting torn apart by this shear layer. And then very quickly, it gets suppressed. So now you see a much quieter turbulent zone. And at some point, uh, there's a whole story behind the Reynolds stress that's driven by the turbulence and how it drives the flows that ultimately trigger this transition. I'm not going to go into that in detail here other than to just mention that in passing. But now we have this 2D flow field that's derived from these measurements and looking at the, how the individual eddy structures convect um, in space and time. And we're going to apply, uh, look at the um, distribution of these velocities in more detail. 
So here's some spectra, long time averaged uh, windows of the um, uh, velocity. So this is not now the density turbulence, but the inferred velocity. So here's a radial velocity spectrum and a poloidal velocity spectrum. And you can see there's much different characteristics between the two. Um, Spatially, this sort of makes sense. If you increase the separation between the point measurements, these are cross power spectra, you get a monotonically decaying um, cross power over the scale of a few centimeters that immediately tells you that you, again, have a velocity correlation length of a few centimeters like you do with the turbulence density uh, fluctuations itself. And it's kind of a broadband spectrum extending up to a few hundred kilohertz. Uh, in the poloidal direction, we have a much different uh, structure. Again, there's sort of a, rapid, a more rapidly decaying broadband structure, but then there's this somewhat coherent mode at low frequency. And um, we didn't know this at the time, but it turns out that this is a uh, feature called a geodesic acoustic mode, which is driven by the turbulence and actually acts to self-stabilize. But again, this shows the strong radial and azimuthal or poloidal asymmetry in the turbulence because the structure does not show up at all in the radial velocity. So on the time scale, the movie I showed you back here, you wouldn't see this mode. It's, um, it's about a 15 kilohertz oscillation, and uh, so about a 70 microsecond period. So you don't see it by eye, but it's going on in the background, kind of oscillating up and down uh, at a relatively low amplitude. But nevertheless, it comes out quite clearly when you do these long time average spectra. And this feature turns out to be critical to the saturation mechanism of turbulence. Um, so this turbulence is here, but is it important? Is it actually convecting particles and transport? It's not immediately obvious that it is, but so we interpreted both the density measure, sorry, pardon me, not learning, learning how to use this, both the density and the radial velocity component that's inferred from the velocimetry techniques to get a um, inferred particle flux. And an important quantity is the phase relationship between the density and the radial velocity. And again, from the, the, radi or the density field alone, we don't know what the underlying dynamics are, because there's an important but unmeasured quantity here, which is the electrostatic potential. But we assume that there is some um, E cross B motion, and if it's phased in such a way, then you can get some net outward flux. And when we do this ensemble averaged uh, measurement here, we do in that indeed see that there is a net radially outward uh, particle flux over the last 10% of the minor radius. So that turbulence I was showing you earlier is in fact moving the particles from the core of the plasma out across the separatrix uh, into the boundary zone. This is the uh, sort of magnetic boundary here at uh, unity minor radius. So this last 10% of the minor radius is a particularly critical zone where the turbulence is uh, basically mixing and conveying the particles and therefore the energy and momentum they carry out into the separatrix. And it gives us, it tells us a lot about the unmeasured um, electrostatic potential, but that is very important for these measurements. And separate measurements with probes that can both measure the density and electrostatic potential directly give a similar result. Um, so we can see this. Now just to, this is sort of a qualitative impact, but if you look at the raw data signals, you see another factor about how this transport is taking place. It turns out that the skewness of the probability distribution function of the turbulence changes very rapidly across this boundary zone near the edge of the plasma. So the, the skewness here, um, again, sort of the, the third moment of the probability distribution function, is slightly negative uh, inside, just inside the plasma, um, but it's, it's statistically negative. The, the error bars are small enough that this is below zero. It then gets very negative right inside the separatrix, and then it quickly changes sign at the separatrix, the boundary, and then goes positive here. And because of the 2D array, and because it was not perfectly aligned with the magnetic geometry, we had, a, we had several more data points at effectively higher spatial resolution. These are shown in blue. And they kind of show a very consistent story of a rapidly changing skewness. And you can see this sort of qualitatively by eye in the raw data here. You see this sort of negatively spiking um, density here, which is equivalent to holes in the plasma sort of developing. And then right at the boundary, it becomes more Gaussian-like. And then in the, in the scrape off or boundary region, you actually have these positive structures. So this is sort of qualitative evidence uh, that you do have this um, mixing and this sort of scooping of the particles from inside to outside as a result of the, uh, the turbulence there. So, how am I on time? A couple minutes. Five. Okay, that's good. One more, one more topic I wanted to uh, mention here. 
Um, a question comes up as to when you have these strong gradients and this geometry, how does the turbulence stabilize itself? And I mentioned earlier the ob observation of this geodesic acoustic mode. But the, uh, for many years, the theorists in our community were asking us to try to find this uh, elusive so-called zonal flow. And it was predicted theoretically, basically the, the underlying mechanism is that the turbulence through a Reynolds stress mechanism was predicted to drive a zonal flow, something analogous to the jet stream. And this was, to be, this was predicted to be critical to the stabilization of the turbulence, essentially the saturation mechanism. And uh, the, the basic nature of this zonal flow is that it's, uh, it's basically a potential of radially localized but azimuthally and toroidally uniform uh, potential structure that results in a radial electric field that's shown by these black arrows here. And then in a magnetically conf uh, confined plasma, you have an E cross B flow, which then kind of goes up and down locally. And essentially the concept is that the turbulence drives this, shear this flow, which then shears the turbulence. So it acts as a self-stabilizing mechanism. But did this actually exist in the plasma? So we went to look for these zonal flow phenomena. What we found was in, in the poloidal velocity spectrum, as I showed you earlier, these very coherent modes that had the features of this theoretically predicted geodesic acoustic mode. And then we looked at the frequency of this mode. It turned out to match very closely with the uh, predicted uh, GAM frequency. There's a slight offset, which might come from geometric factors. But basically, it depends on the sound speed of the plasma. That's the underlying parameter and the geometry. It scales as, the, as CS over A, and we showed that experimentally. Also, there's a uniformity to this structure. This was obser observed on a different uh, tokamak here. This is a measurement obtained with a Doppler backscattering system on the ASDEX tokamak, a completely different technique, a different part of the world. But fortunately, there was a, a uniformity to the plasma behavior. It also showed this very coherent structure, which we've since identified as the uh, geodesic acoustic mode. The question then comes, well, this is there, but is it actually doing something? And it turns out, if you look carefully at the amplitude spectrum of the underlying turbulence, what you do see is that there's an amplitude modulation right at the GAM frequency, which tells you that, yes, this, this geodesic acoustic mode, or GAM, is, in fact, modulating and helping to stabilize or saturate the underlying turbulence. And if you look more carefully at the dynamics of it, you perform a bispectrum between the density fluctuations, the poloidal density gradient of the fluctuations, and the poloidal velocity fluctuations. There's a lot of math behind this, which I won't go through here. But this uh, three-way bispectrum is a measure of energy being transferred within the turbulence uh, spectrum. And when this was evaluated, you did indeed see these very clear bands and um, it's not very clear here, but the, the frequency separation between sort of the F1 equals F2 line here is exactly the GAM frequency. And there's a positive band at, uh, at along here and a negative band uh, below that. And what this says is that the geodesic acoustic mode is basically moving energy uh, from lower frequency to higher frequency in steps of the GAM frequency. So it again provide further uh, assurance that it wasn't just sitting there in the background, but it was in fact helping to mediate and saturate the underlying turbulence there. So just one final note before I conclude. Uh, most of the, pretty much everything I've showed you here today was data, uh, measurements of the turbulence, but there's been a lot of effort in our field, and this came up yesterday in the uh, general um, public discussion, about the about the um, collaboration or interactions between the experimental community, theoretical, and simulation community. And we've been doing some quantitative comparisons between the measured turbulence spectra and the calculated spectra. There's, been, there's very advanced uh, numerical codes. Um, Taksu Ham, that you heard earlier, is an expert in these. Uh, they've been developed. They can predict quantitatively what the turbulence is like. So we did a comparison. Uh, between the measured turbulence spectrum, which is shown in blue here, and then the uh, predicted or calculated uh, spectrum uh, from what's called the gyro code. This is a nonlinear turbulence simulation code in red. And this is a quantitative graph. There's no free variables here. And it shows that you, in fact, uh, have very good agreement, very good quantitative agreement between the amplitude and the, and the spectrum of the underlying turbulence there. And this is at a mid-radius location of the plasma. If you move out to the edge of the plasma, there is somewhat of an anomaly. We found that there was almost a factor of 10 difference. And at this point, this is still an unresolved issue. It might be a code issue. There might be something to do with the comparisons. But we don't understand why there's such a difference. So there are some significant outstanding problems. Uh, some other codes have done this, and they show less of a discrepancy 
uh, between the measured turbulence and the calculated, but it seems to be important and we are working to try to understand that. So then let me just uh, summarize and conclude here. So I hope I've demonstrated to you that plasma turbulence um, and the resulting cross-field transport is a very important phenomena in um, magnetically confined plasmas. It drives transport of particles, energy, and momentum. Generally, this is deleterious to plasma confinement, although it can have some benefits, such as the transport of impurity particles and other things that you don't want in the core plasma. Um, we've developed many measurement techniques to investigate the properties, and um, it's, again, largely two-dimensional in nature, which is kind of convenient and gives us a lot of mathematical and uh, physical analogs, so like atmospheric turbulence. The turbulence obeys the theoretically predicted spatial temporal uh, scaling with respect to the ion gyro radius, which is sort of a fundamental driving parameter here. And um, there's a few beneficial impacts, like I, I showed you. It does drive a self-stabilizing or saturating zonal flows, and it actually helps to trigger a phenomenon that actually improves the confinement of the plasma quite a bit, which is kind of a subject of uh, a whole different talk. And at least our computational simulations are providing reasonable comparisons, although not in all cases, as I showed you, which are helping to reinforce our predictive capability for the performance of burning plasma reactors. But there are many outstanding problems, how the uh, turbulence uh, saturates, how different fields look, and so there's a lot more to do in this area. So I appreciate your time and be happy to entertain any questions you might have.